to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them by your truth, your word, is truth. John 17, verse number 17. We hear from the voice of Jesus how He believed and prayed to the Father that God's Word was truth. And today we're going to be thinking about Jesus' teaching on inspiration. What did Jesus believe about the Scriptures? You see, the Bible teaches I'm to have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2 verse 5. The Bible teaches that I'm to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, 1 Peter 2 verse 21 and 22. And the Bible teaches that I am to let the light of Jesus shine in my life, Matthew 5 16. As I think about doing that and it relates to the scripture, what did Jesus believe and teach? about the Bible, about the Word of God. That's what we're going to be considering in our second lesson on inspiration today. And we're so glad that you've joined us for our study. We want to encourage you to find your Bible and have it ready as we're going to be looking to the Word of God as our final authority in our study today. And friend, we hope today that you'll visit the Church of Christ in your area. This lesson and our program is being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. And I will assure you, the Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You'll find people there who love God, who love the Word of God, and are only concerned about helping men and women get to heaven. And so visit the Church of Christ, whether it be on Sunday or Wednesday. If you've got a Bible question, you want to study more, you'd like to know about the plan of salvation, they would love to sit down and talk to you about the Word of God. Here at the Gospel of Christ, our main emphasis is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. And that world begins with you. If, you. if we can help you in any way in your journey to know God's Word better, please let us know. Visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, we have a large background, a large uh, gathering of study material. We have written material, transcripts, study questions. All of our, our whole volume of lessons is archived online. And you can access all of that free of charge. That's thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, we'll even send that to you free of charge, whether it be on CD or DVD. Just go to our website, fill out a media request form, or contact, contact us at the information given at the end of our program. Let's now take our time to think about how the Lord felt about inspiration. We saw in our last lesson the importance of Bible inspiration in our world today. We thought about what the Bible claims that it is inspired and how the, the, the Word proclaims that it is from God. But what is the mind of Jesus? You know, I want to have the mind of Jesus. Philippians 2 verse 5. What was the mind of Jesus on Bible inspiration? And so we're going to take just a few moments today and we're going to think about some of the words of the Lord that He said that instruct us on His view of inspiration and help tune each of our hearts in greater tune with the Word of God. Let's begin by noting, noting that Jesus believed. Jesus believed and He clearly taught the Scriptures were of divine inspiration. If you have your Bible handy, I want you to look with me in Matthew chapter 22, verse number 43. Notice what Jesus said about the Scriptures being of divine inspiration. Then He said to them, how then does David, watch this, in the Spirit 
Call Him Lord, saying, Sit at your right hand till your Lord makes your enemies your footstool. When I think about Jesus' view of inspiration, Jesus so clearly and powerfully taught that the Spirit said to David. David didn't say it. It wasn't David's idea. It was the Spirit speaking to David. And so Jesus, as we saw throughout the Bible, Jesus clearly believed and taught the Scriptures were of divine inspiration. Friend, I hope you'll hear me well today. The Scriptures are not fables. The Scriptures are not popular opinion of that day. The Scriptures are not what Paul or Mark or David may have thought. The Scripture, the Word of God, is of divine origin. That is, God's mind is found in the Word of God and how powerful it is to hear Jesus say those words. But what else did Jesus believe about the Scripture? Jesus taught, clearly taught, that the Scriptures were full, complete, and indestructible. Look in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Matthew chapter 5, I want you to notice Jesus teaching here about the Scripture. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Watch this now. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. Jesus didn't come to, to break down the Bible. That's not the idea. Jesus came to complete it. He is the completion of every prophecy in the Old Testament. And He said this, and listen to this language. Here's the heart of Jesus as it relates to the Bible. Not one jot or one tittle shall pass away until, adverb of time, all is fulfilled. What does that tell me about Jesus' view of the Word of God, Jesus clearly believed the Scriptures were full, complete, and indestructible. Now that phraseology, one jot or one tittle, that is the smallest pen stroke in the language of that day. It would be similar to dotting your I and crossing your T. Every bit of the Word of God is going to be fulfilled about me, Jesus said. And so he believed. And friend, that's such a, another powerful idea. Not only did Jesus teach it's of divine origin, he believed it was complete and full. And friend, here's the practical application to that. I don't need, listen carefully now, according to Jesus, because the Bible is complete and full, not one jot and tittle is going to pass away, I do not need. All of men's opinions, all the books of men, all the catechisms and, and doctrines of men. I don't need to poll the public to see what to do. If the Bible is full and complete, it's all I need to get to heaven. Isn't that what 2 Peter 1.3 says? The, in God's Word, we have everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us. Friend, this is good news today. All you need to be saved and to be right with God is the Bible. If a person will take his Bible, read it, study it, and do what it says, the Bible alone will make you a Christian and help you live in such a way that you can be right with God. What else do we know about Jesus' teaching concerning inspiration? Jesus clearly believed and taught that the Scriptures were without error. That is, they cannot be broken. Listen to the words of John chapter 10. Take your Bible and look in the Gospel of John. I love this statement by Jesus about the Scripture. Look in John chapter 10. John chapter 10 verse 35, Jesus says this, If He called them gods to whom the Word of God came, and watch this parenthetical statement, and the Scripture cannot be broken. And he goes on to say, here's the fulfillment of that. What's the point of that parenthetical statement? If Jesus said it, you can take it to the bank because God's Word is not going to lie. Friend, the Scripture cannot be broken emphasizes that they're infallible, that they're without error, that they don't contain all the errors and problems that, that, that men put in it. You know, if you sit down and write a manuscript or you sit down and write a book, how many misspelled words are you going to have? 
How many errors are there going to be? How many things you've got to go back and proof check? Well, a bunch, probably. God's Word cannot be broken. It's full. It's complete. It's infallible. When, here's what we want to drive home, and this is such a powerful lesson. When God says it, you can re absolutely rest assured that's the way it's going to be. Now, let's make that even more practical. Friend, when God promises it, you can rest your hope fully on God's promises. And do you know why? Because the Scripture cannot be broken. When God says things like in 1 John 2 verse 25, this is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. If we walk in the light, obey the gospel, live faithful unto death, and we're promised eternal life, why can I put my hope in that? Because the Scripture, it is impossible for the Word of God to be broken. It's going to happen if God says it. That's Jesus' view of inspiration. But let me give you another view that Jesus emphasized about the Scriptures. Jesus clearly taught, emphatically taught, that the Scriptures were the final authority from Almighty God. I want to take your mind to an event in Matthew chapter 4 with me. Jesus is being tempted by Satan. He's out in the wilderness. He's alone. He's being tempted by Satan. And Satan throws everything in his arsenal at him. If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Uh, throw yourself off the temple. God will take care of you in essence. All these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. And Satan will try and misuse, but try every time to quote Scripture. But in answering Satan, do you remember what Jesus said three times? This is so powerful. It is written... It is written, it is written. What's the point of that? God said it, and that settles it. My friend, Jesus absolutely believed the Scriptures were our final authority. I'm going to be judged by the Word of God, and so are you. John 12, 48. Jesus said, He who rejects me does not receive my word, has that which judges him. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And friend, again, that's good news. I don't need to, I don't have to worry about all these other books, all these other ideas, all these other things. No, all I've got to give attention to is living my life by God's word, the final authority. And the good news again, if a person does that, friend, this is so encouraging. If I'll follow the Bible, if I'll live my life by it, if I'll try to walk in the light, try to do what God wants me to every day, it's impossible for God to lie. Titus 1 verse 2, Hebrews 6 verse 18. And God's promised those who do that can spend eternity in heaven with Him. Don't you want to go to heaven? That's the confidence we have in the Word of God. But you know, Jesus not only believed the Scriptures were our final authority, as it relates to Jesus' teaching on inspiration, Jesus also believed that the Scriptures were historically accurate. Uh, let me give you an illustration. Open your Bible, Matthew chapter 12. I want you to see what Jesus said about the historical accuracy of the Scriptures. Jesus said these words in Matthew 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, watch this now, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Well, indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. You've got three historical accounts that are mentioned here, and Jesus' argument kind of rests on these. What does the Scripture say? You've got Jonah, you've got the Queen of the South, and you've got, um, you've got the mentioning of Solomon here. And every one of these is historically accurate and true from the mind of Jesus. And so what do I know about the Bible, the Word of God? Friend, it's true in every way. Someone says, ah, oh, the story of Jonah, that's a big fable. No, it's not. How do I know it's not? Jesus said so. You mean a, a, a great fish? If God said it did, it did. You mean Solomon had all that money? If God said it did. All these events that we see. And friend, you can study the history of the Bible and you can see it line up perfectly in every way with human history because the Bible is perfect. It's God's divine will. Now you say, okay, that's good, but how does that apply? Friend, when we teach our children, 
about creation, that's historically accurate. When we teach our children about Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Noah and David and the events of the Old Testament, Daniel in the lion's den, I'm not teaching them some type of fable that really isn't true, but there's a good moral story there. We can know the Bible is historically accurate in each and every way, and God clearly teaches us that. But you know, Jesus also taught that the Scriptures were scientifically accurate as well. Look at Matthew chapter 19, and I want you to see Jesus' reference. As Jesus is going to speak about marriage, He makes a reference back to the origin and the science of it. Look at Matthew 19. And I want you to see what Jesus said in Matthew 19, verses 2 through 5. As it relates to creation, Jesus said it was accurate. And great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them there. The Pharisees also came to Jesus, testing Him and saying to Him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now watch what Jesus goes to as proof about God's plan for marriage. And He answered and said to them, Have you not read that He who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. When I hear those words, He who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and, and God said, leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. What's Jesus doing there? He is telling us that the account of creation in Genesis is true and accurate and inspired by God. And so we've got the, the accuracy of God on creation and the way things worked with Almighty God. Friend, you're going to hear a lot maybe in life about, about evolution. You're going to hear a lot about men's ideas and the world is billions and billions of years old and, and that uh, God didn't really create the world, but the world just kind of came into existence. You'll hear about Charles Darwin and the theory of evolution. What do I know from the mouth of Jesus? Jesus believed that what was wrote and what was said in Genesis chapter 1 was absolutely historically accurate and true, meaning that when God created the earth in six literal 24-hour days, Jesus put His stamp of approval on that by going back to the beginning in Matthew chapter 19, verses 2 through 5. But let me share another idea with you, and we mentioned this just a little bit, but just to drive the point home. Our Lord clearly taught that the Scriptures were factually inerrant, meaning the Bible doesn't make mistakes, and Jesus clearly taught that. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 22, and I want you to see what Jesus said about the inerrancy of the Bible in Matthew chapter 22, verse number 29. Jesus is dealing with the Sadducees and Pharisees who are greatly mistaken about the resurrection. And look at what He says here. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. And of course, we remember the words of John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What's the power of God and the power of the Scriptures? That they're never wrong that God's got the right answer, and that if I'll submit to God's will, I can live with Him for all eternity. But friend, here's the powerful teaching of our Lord about the Scriptures. Jesus, in believing about the inspiration of Scripture, also emphatically taught that it is the Scriptures that give spiritual clarity to a person's life. In a world that is uh, filled with religious chaos, in a world where people are so confused on matters of religion today, Jesus taught the Scriptures is what gives clarity. How do we know that? Look in Luke chapter 24. Jesus has been resurrected. He's talking with the two men on the road to Emmaus. And uh, look in verse number 44 of Luke 24. Then He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning Me. Now notice, And He opened their understanding that they might, Jesus said, that they might comprehend the Scripture. By going back to the Bible 
and helping them see the fulfillment of all of this, the Word of God and Jesus there helped open their spiritual clarity, gave them understanding. And friend, that's the idea behind Bible inspiration. In a world where there's nearly a view on everything as it relates to religion, in a world where so many people are teaching so many different doctrines and ideas, if you want clarity and you want truth and you want to put all the chaos and confusion aside, direct your attention only to the inspired Word of God. Jesus took the Word of God. He helped them to understand it and it opened the Scripture to them and they saw clearly from the Scripture. But you know, Jesus also believed that it was the Scripture that was sufficient for life and for faith. Luke chapter 16, we've got a very sad story in many ways. You've got the story of the rich man and Lazarus and their roles are reversed on the other side. In this life, the rich man had it all. Lazarus was a poor beggar. On the other side, Lazarus is carried by angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man awakes in torments. And what are the things he requests? Father Abraham, I've got five brothers. I pray that you'll send someone back and tell them about this so that they don't have to come to this terrible place of torment in essence. And do you remember what Abraham said? They have Moses and the Scriptures. Let them hear them. What is Jesus saying there? Men are going to be saved. They're going to get faith and they're going to have everything they need for life through the Scriptures. God's Word is sufficient to live the best life possible. John 10 verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. In Christ, you'll find the abundant and the best life and it's got everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us. And so when we think about Jesus and God as it relates to inspiration, friend, consider this with me. The Bible teaches that God is true. Romans 3 verse 4, He is the true and living God. The Scriptures teach that God's Word, the Bible, is breathed out by the mouth of God. And so we have the true God who breathed out the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17, And therefore the conclusion we must come to is, if the true God breathed out the Scriptures from His mouth, then friends, those must be absolute and final truth on all matters of religion. You see, we read in the Scripture that truth is an attribute of our God. John 1 verse 14, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth are found in Jesus Christ. And we read in the Scripture that God always, always, always speaks truthfully and that He does not lie. Titus 1 verse 2 actually says this, it is impossible for God who cannot lie. God, it's against who God is. It's impossible for Him to lie. And then, friend, we're told that the words of the Bible, we're told the Scripture is from God. If God can't lie, if He always speaks the truth, if He is the essence of truth, then whatever comes out of the mouth of God, friend, that's true. And the good news today is that's found right here in the pages of the Bible. If you want to know truth, real truth, you want to know what really matters, you want to know how to live in such a way that in eternity and in this life you can be blessed, the Bible has that message and Jesus clearly taught that. Listen again to it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now notice this, that the man of God may be complete. What do you mean complete? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friend, how thankful to God we ought to be for the Bible. What a blessing beyond measure it is that I can know the mind and the, and the heart of God and I can know what I need to do to be right with God and that that word indeed is true and will always stand the test of time. Here's how powerful the Word of God is. In Matthew chapter 24, 
verses 34 through 36, Jesus taught us another powerful truth about the Word of God. And that is this. When this old earth and time itself has stood still and has perished away, the Word of God will still stand. Heaven and earth will pass away. My Word will never pass away, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 34 through 36. And so if I put my hope and faith in the Word of God, when everything else tumbles around, it crumbles down, you can be sure you'll stand the test of time with God because you've put your hope and your faith in the Almighty Word of God. Friend, we ask you today to consider this serious question. If this book, if this book, the Bible, is from God, and we've seen today that it is, are you living your life according to the Bible? If you left this earth right now, where would you spend eternity? Jesus told us there's only two options. The righteous will go away into eternal life. The unrighteous into eternal condemnation. Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you living according to the Bible? Are you walking in the light? And are you really possessing the mind of Jesus in every way? If you're not a Christian, we're begging you today. Obey the gospel. Do what the Bible says. Believe. The Bible says you've got to hear the word of God to have faith. Romans 10, 17. Having heard that message, studied it, believed it to be true, you must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, 24. Having believed in Jesus, would you do a turnaround, turn from sin to God? Luke 13, verse 3. And having repented of sin, would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. And then having done all those things to be saved, would you be baptized? 1 Peter 3, 21 says it this way. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Have you obeyed God's plan of salvation? If not, we're urging you today, become a Christian. If you are a Christian, let's have a renewed zeal to study God's Word, to give our heart to it, and to never stop living by the Word of God. We hope you'll join us next time as we'll study more from God's divine Word. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the